Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. We're back. Well, welcome to season four of Mintel's Little Conversation, where our experts bring you fresh ideas and new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom, and think. I'm your host, Andrew Davidson, based in New York. And to kick off the new season, we have a great episode looking at the outlook for advertising and marketing in 2022. Where are we heading? What do we need to pay attention to? And what are the implications? Now, to discuss this topic, I'm delighted to welcome to the pod for the first time, Bruce Beagle, founder and senior managing partner of Winterbury Group, a managing consulting firm serving the ad industry. Bruce is an entrepreneur and an advisor who has served on numerous boards, including the Direct Marketing Association. He's also a longtime friend of Mintel. Bruce, welcome to the pod. Andrew, thank you. It's great to be here. Where are you today? I am home in Miami. Excellent. Now, not only are we blessed with Bruce's insights today, I'm also delighted to welcome back a regular guest and Mintel's resident expert on all things related to omni-channel marketing, Leon Emke. Leon, welcome. Hi, happy to be here, Andrew, and happy fourth season. It's very exciting. I, uh, it is extremely exciting. Where are you today? Um, I'm in Chicago, trying to brave the cold. I, I, of course, I know that. Of course, I know that. Now, now so Bruce, every year, um, you put together your predictions for the industry, uh, including a forecast of marketing spend across some 20 marketing channels. You're predicting double-digit growth for 2022 for the second year running. Uh, before we get into the predictions themselves, tell us how you started. Um, you know, I think you're now in your 15th year of doing this. Uh, and how are you gathering this information? So, started with some friends said, can you come to the Direct Marketing Club of New York and would you pull together your thinking and give us an outlook? And I think we were looking at that point, there were probably you know, six or seven offline channels and, and a handful of digital channels. Search was still early. Yeah. So many of the things that we've seen evolve hadn't happened. We were, we were the DMA's number for direct mail, you know, fueled with insights from Intel and Comper Media and the work that we were doing in strategy and planning. And we started to look at, you know, where does that fit in the rest of the channels? Mm. Um, and then it evolved until it became a regular thing. I think the other part was because it's in January, it just forces you to get your act together on what you're thinking about for the year. So it was very good for us internally to get focused. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice way to kick off the year. How, so how do you gather the, the information? So it's a combination. So we've been building models on, on the spend side probably since... 2005, 16, 17 years now. Um, some of those models, you know, we are building from the ground up. We, we look at spend, we look at trend, we look at for direct mail, for example, you know, we look at the post office, we look at the trends that you provide. We, we actually go bottoms up and see how our clients are doing in that sector. We expand it from there into email, into display. And then around 2010, we started building data models to understand what, what is, how is data driving the market, including not just the offline world, but the emerging digital world. Um, and we have been creating those data models and updating them. They also started, you know, there were probably four revenue streams in there. Now I think our model has 40 or 50 lines worth of data that we aggregate and look at channel by channel and, and break it down. Uh, so this has been an evolution process, but we also go and look and say, all right, what is Magnus doing? What does Zenith say? Like, we're not going to come up with a new number for linear TV. You know, there are plenty of experts. So we draw on the experts from the industry mm -hmm. and we overlay what we're seeing from our clients and the models that we build. All right. So what is your prediction for marketing spend in 2022 and what's driving it? First, I think it's 11%. Or so growth here in the United States mm -hmm. uh, across those 20 channels. It's not evenly split, but it wasn't evenly split in 2021. I think you know part of what is driving that is the convergence of offline and online. That we are actually look, we've been talking about on the channel for many years. We're beginning to see that convergence that was projected 10 years ago starting to happen now. And so as 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 CPMs have risen. In social, in search, in linear TV, channels like mail, suddenly the return on ad spend starts to look better. Mm. So, so companies that may have reached the, the right level of investment in one channel 
are saying, okay, what's the next channel? You know, is it mail? Is it CTV? Is it OTT? You know, where should I put that next incremental dollar of investment? I think the other driver is last year was a very profitable year for many brands. You know, and and advertising and marketing spend is always a percentage of revenue, but it gets freed up more when the brands are being profitable. And we saw in, even in the fourth quarter numbers, for the most part, maybe Meta excluded, you know, we have seen fantastic numbers coming out. You know, just look at Google growing yeah. at thirty six percent. So digital grew in 2021, right on that 36% level, you know, which, is, which is extraordinary. But you also start to see markets come back in the offline world. So sponsorship and events, experiential. So you just have this general tailwind of new money coming in because of the profit and growth of the industry. Yeah, that's I mean, fascinating. I mean, let's talk about digital. I mean, like you mentioned, oh, Google, Amazon as well, you know, reporting 2021 results, huge uh, growth in advertising revenue specifically. Um, looking at your, you know, online marketing spend uh, forecast predictions, I think you had the top three uh, channels, not surprisingly, obviously, search, but paid social, digital video. You know, where are you predicting the fastest growth uh, in 2022 and why? Uh, I think there's a couple of things that, that we're really watching closely. Um, one, we are seeing money that may have been in other channels that were like trade promotion dollars have moved into retail media marketplaces. So Amazon, then Walmart, then Roundell. All of a sudden, it's Target, it's Kroger, it's you know, it's not just CPG. We're seeing it in auto. So there are marketplaces forming. You know, that broadly are, are covered as retail media marketplaces. And there's a, there's a, I think 20 billion was spent in 2020. And the outlook this year is 40 billion will be spent. And yes, Amazon and Walmart are grabbing their share, but there are over a hundred retail media marketplaces, not just domestically, but on a global basis. So we've seen new money coming in that might have been trade promotion, money that's performance driven, designed to move product off shelves, not just generate impressions and brand awareness. Um, we're seeing convergence in video. So you're seeing, okay, linear actually held its own last year. You know, it was effectively, you know, flat. Um, this year you have an Olympics, you have an election that will give fuel, but we've seen a, a market shift where brands have said to their agencies and their partners, look, go find me, Andrew across all of my video spend. So I want Andrew on his phone, his laptop, his tablet, the screens within his house. And I want to reach Andrew with video. So if you look at digital video plus CTV spend, plus linear spend, plus addressable TV spend, there's about $130 billion being spent on digital video. Mm. And that is growing rapidly. But it's, you have to think differently because now when you're shooting that spot or you're taking that video, you think cross format and not just I'm using this for a commercial at the Super Bowl. Yeah, those are all really interesting points. I think um, the video one in particular, because I think as we're entering this new age, kind of on the tail end of the pandemic, there's a lot of brands, especially when they're having all of these newfound revenue going into their business. Um, they're trying to define what exactly their brand equity is to consumers. And I mean, the main channel to do that in order to like, tell that story is to go to video. Mm. Um, but, you know, the research that um, I and my team have done in the past you know, few months that I think is really indicative of you know, future evolutions of marketing is kind of the sh- shifting consumer relationship with different marketing channels. So, you know, we're all well aware of the great transition, right? And how people are finding jobs right now. Um, There's also a huge boom in weddings this year and people are buying more houses and more cars. There's a lot of big life milestones that consumers are hitting. And we're seeing that reflected in paid search. So um, large banks are investing a lot more in question-related keywords in order to target those consumers that are asking those big life questions you know, with financial services, like how to invest in marketing. And that's a way for brands to, you know, not only reach out to these high intent consumers, but allows them to control the narrative for this uh, newfound frontier 
for these consumers by pushing their own products that would help solve their problems, right? So um, we're seeing that in paid search. And I think the most interesting thing that my team has come across is the change in relationship to social media and paid social. Um, of course, we talked about Meta, but um, when it comes to trends, I think we have to bring up TikTok. I think TikTok has really changed the game in terms of consumers' relationship with social media. So we found that 55% of consumers use social media to discover new brands and products. And that's really indicative to how social media has evolved from being like a mid-funnel play, right? Targeting consumers that are already familiar with your products to being a brand awareness play. We're seeing a lot more brands utilize social media in the same way that we would see them utilize digital video in order to tell a brand story and to be a source of entertainment. So I think a really interesting example in this field is um, State Farm. So they're actually opting out of a Super Bowl ad this year and instead are doing the TikTok challenge. So that's really showing how brands' uh, yes. relationship, yeah, it's really showing how brands' relationship with social media is changing to much more upper funnel, even in the face of a huge brand event or a huge event like the Super Bowl. Yeah, well, it sounds fascinating. And, and uh, obviously, Bruce is... Uh, predictions back all that up um moving on to sort of t- talk about the uh, sort of offline then environments um you know i know uh bruce you had the the top um spend for 2022 i think you're predicting uh, linear tv direct mail and then a bucket of experiential slash sponsorship again where, where are you predicting the fastest growth and why um so what i'm hearing right now is in now um as we've talked to a number of the mailers we've talked to the print letter shops. Ultimately, what predicts mail is what's happening with the people who sell the data for customer acquisition and what actually comes out the other end. Mm. Uh, we are seeing, because of paper and supply chain constraints, there's actually a bottleneck getting the mail out the door. But search being the first thing that you do, social being the second thing that you do. So we're seeing real growth there. I think, as I said before, I think linear gets propped up, but experiential marketing is interesting. You know, it was a $45 billion category in 2019. It dropped $25 billion in 20, like It almost got cut in half in 2020 as we all got locked in. Right. It's $10 billion up last year. We expect it to pick up another 6 or $7 billion this year as we get out. Of, people are tired of being home. You know, it got Omnicom definitely delayed it a little bit. But as I was saying before, I was in Vegas you know, earlier this week, and there were 400 people at the bar with name badges on. So it's obviously coming back. Right. Um, but it's still got a ways to go. We don't think it's actually fully back for another two years. Yeah. But I've been seeing in my research, and um, Andrew, I think we talked about this the other day, but don't sleep on out of home. You know, a lot of people are thinking that out of home yeah. is dead. Absolutely not. We're seeing a resurgence in brands investment into that channel. Even Klarna, that's a very digital focused channel and very much attuned to the Gen Z and millennial market. They predicted that 44% of Gen Z and millennials would go shopping in malls for the holiday season. So they're very bullish about out of home as well. Um, But I think what's important for, you know, marketers to understand about out of home is that you know, it's, uh, the strategy is shifting. So it's becoming less of targeting a local market, um, but becoming more of trying to spark a global conversation. So I think something that we're going to be seeing in the upcoming year are a lot of really interesting campaigns that are going to be really shareable and spark that online conversation on social media. Yeah. Yeah. I would completely agree with that. What we're seeing is certainly New York, Los Angeles, London, the innovation in motion video on digital out of home signage. Some stuff in London is just spectacular. 3D images of you know monsters coming out of screens. It's it's a perception. It's a, as you just said, it's a conversation starter. There's also if you're in theatrical or you're in a, a and you're in a, a, a luxury brand where being at the center of the conversation matters. They are spending more money. And it's not just it's static out of home as well as digital out of home. But we, we think it's really interesting. And again, it's part of that growth. 
Yeah, and it goes back to what you were saying, Bruce, about that convergence, doesn't it? Because obviously, if it is spectacular and if it is interesting, then it can be shared on TikTok, as you were saying, uh, Learen, or you can be posted on Instagram. The whole thing can converge together. Um, I'd also interested, of course, you know, the, the, on the direct mail um, prediction that you had. You know, obviously, big focus that we have at Compare Media is on financial services, on on, on credit cards, and. You know, you know, we're seeing this increase in demand for credit, but we're also seeing an increase in the supply of credit through the marketing. And um, you know, in the in the US, the Federal Reserve uses um, you know credit card direct mail sort of activity as a proxy for the supply of credit. And of course, um, that is set to or poised to sort of go into hyperdrive in in uh, 2022. I was listening to some of the earnings calls from the banks recently, all suggesting huge numbers in terms of. Uh, marketing spend across all channels. You know, America Express talked about spending another $5 billion. Uh, Capital One, uh, Chase, both seem to be looking like they'll spend $4 billion on marketing. So, all uh, supporting um, what you're saying here, Bruce. But I know that you have, um, you do these predictions also in the UK. You mentioned the out-of-home advertising in the UK there. Um, what, what else are you seeing there? Um, I think the last couple of quarters in direct mail were really strong. We started looking at the market again 10, 12 years ago, right as it went from a direct mail market and pivoted to digital. And it pivoted much harder, much faster than the US to go to a digital marketplace. Uh, we're starting to see both TV and digital, uh, sorry, TV and offline direct mail starting to come back. Mm, okay. Um, I think, you know, if we were up 26 or so, last year um, and we're forecasting 11 they're forecasting about eight percent growth the fastest growth you know in the Euro- uh, in the European market so strong growth outlook for 2022 much more converged online and offline but TV starting and, and converged TV a lot of that's being driven by brands coming over from the states you know that, that are doing connected TV you know you've got your HBOs and your Warners and your Disney's, et cetera, that are expanding and pushing the market in the UK. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I know you've been out, you know, sharing your predictions uh, with clients, investors, and at industry events. Yeah, what's what's the reaction been so far? Well, I think the reaction is, yeah, we felt it last year. I think when you get ad spend growth, it was look, twenty twenty was a tough year. It was it was the first year of real decline in a while. Last year, there was a huge, it's been like 18 months of a, you know, consecutive growth. And they're seeing it with, you know, within their own businesses or the business they're investing in, depending on which side we're on. Um, the question is, okay, what is sustainable? If everybody had a great hockey stick, 26% up is great. If everybody hockey stick, who sustains that growth? And what sectors, as we look out, not at 22, they, they're, they're past that. It's what happens in 23, 24, 25. And will this growth sustain? We, we happen to think that over time, we will get back to a more normal advertising spend growing at about two times GDP. And GDP is supposed to go down and get back to that kind of 2 percentage to 3% range. So we think we get more normal growth, but nobody's looking at recession. But now the you know instead of the rising tide lifting all boats, you will have to paddle a little harder. Have you found that that two times GDP sort of going back over time is that generally consistent over the years before this you know disruption of the pandemic? Yeah, Mary Meeker when she was at Morgan Stanley did a study. I think she looked at thirty years worth of data, and it was consistent over thirty or forty years. And we've been tracking that the last year. This year was completely out of line. And we think so. Twenty one was was out of line. We're at growth. It was a snapback driven by high profitability. We think twenty two is again a little bit out of line, but starting to get closer to in line. And then we think we start to get more in line as we get out to twenty three, twenty four. Yeah. So it's like so. It's not just that twenty twenty was the anomaly. It's really twenty twenty one was also somewhat of an anomaly because of that. You know, snapback. Um, that you referring to, and, and you're uh, yeah, yeah. a consumer that is fueled by government subsidies. Companies that are fueled with government PPP money, there was a ton of money to spend, 
It was also, if you think about, there was three hundred billion deployed in from private private investors, so private capital. When there's private capital coming into businesses, they're going to spend it on marketing to break their brands free. So you had a lot of early and mid stage unicorns that were fueled with other people's money. So you just keep piling on government money, financial institution money, you know, consumers who couldn't spend on travel, redeploying that money. It adds up into a massive spend and tailwind, yeah. which we think on the financial investor side holds up. There is a wall of capital there. We think obviously the government is going to be very pulled back. Okay, that. Yeah. And, and plus, of course, with 2021, there is that sense of making up for lost time from 2020. It's just like, you know, consumers are spending again. Let's just get out there and capture that. Um, that spend. Um, all right. So zooming out, I mean, let's discuss some of the, the that's, well, I mean, we've been discussing some of it already, but let's dig into some of the sort of macro trends influencing the environment. I know you, um, I think you have nine um, macro trends as sort of key drivers of the, of the landscape. Obviously, we can't discuss all of them. We don't have time. But is there one that stands out in particular that uh, you think would be worth mentioning? I think the two that I've spoken about so far, the convergence of TV mm-hmm. and how that is impacting everything from the creative to where the money is being spent and how it's being spent, uh, the retail media marketplaces, Amazons, etc. Yeah. We talked about social moving around. Um, one area we didn't talk about was D2B. We think there's been, a, there's been a massive shift in how B2B marketers spend their money. They have... You know, it was sales driven in the B2B world right up to 2018, 2019, when B2B marketers said, Oh, yeah, the B2B consumer wants to be treated as if they were B2C. We need to deliver the engagement, the experiences. We need to be better at targeting and messaging and content. And there was a dramatic shift to digital in B2B dollars, you know, initially coming out of experiential and events because couldn't have those. And then, you know, you could do 4 million webinars, but how many can you actually attend? I think we did 90 webinars between 2020 and 2021. You know? and, and that would have been a lot more in person. Yeah. Uh, but B2B spend has shifted and it's not going back. Because that's the other question that you get is, okay, as soon as we can all return to in-person events, does the money shift back? And, and it's not the case. I think it was a 50% increase from 2020 to 21 with another 30% increase in digital expected this year. And a lot of that is going to demand gen and lead gen, you know, where it's, okay, we're going to do account-based marketing. We're going to get smarter at using our digital channels and driving that into our sales teams. So more marketing into sales and sales being king and, oh yeah, we have marketing. Okay. One other point on that. We looked at e-commerce and B2B. E-commerce and B2B was about $1.9 trillion last year, which is a pretty big number. It's forecast to grow to $3.6 trillion by 2025. Mm. So now you have to think about, you know, it's the same performance marketing implications that we saw in direct consumer brands. If that holds out in B2B, you're going to see a lot more shift. Yeah, yeah, well, that's definitely an interesting uh, development. Um, Liaren, I mean, you just published uh, Mintel's omnichannel marketing trends for 2022. What are you? What are you seeing? Is there one that you have that stands out? Well, man, that's a that's a big question. So, you know, Bruce, you mentioned earlier that there's so much more revenue going to these different companies, right? Um, it's a very it's been a very lucrative time for companies, and I think. You know, our trends really reflect the fact that with all of this increased revenue, brands are really rewriting their own value propositions to consumers. And they're really growing their own internal value to consumers, whether it's um, from a product standpoint or where they're reaching their consumers or what kind of service they're going to provide their consumers. I think that, you know, there's a lot of money to play with. And so brands are really experimenting and trying to grow their own internal brands, both from a product and marketing side. So, you know, we published three trends, three marketing trends this year. Um, The first one is ecosystems expanding. So this is brands um, kind of 
growing their own internal products to be a lot more all-inclusive, but we're also seeing that from marketing as well. Um, something that we noted were um, entertainment ecosystems. So I liken it to, you know, the Marvel universe, but we're going to be seeing a lot more kind of like that entertainment universe that these different brands are going to create. It's going to blur the line between like the products they sell and, you know, the brands positioning themselves, themselves as a source of entertainment. Um, our second uh, trend is brands as a life coach. So as you know, a lot of consumers have experienced big um, life milestones in the past couple of years. Brands are utilizing this as an opportunity to position themselves as a consultant to help guide them through these new positions or these new decisions for consumers. Um, and then finally, and I would say this is the one that stands out, Andrew, and it's beyond the screen as we know it. And I do not believe that we've made it about 30 minutes without bringing up the metaverse or NFTs when talking about, you know, future trends. But this discusses how, you know, in marketing, we always think about phone devices or laptops as the main way to reach consumers, right, in a digital world. But we're going to be seeing in the future brands experiment with more novel ways to reach consumers, but that's going to exist on polar ends of the spectrum. So on one end, we're going to be seeing more offline engagement. So this is like the out of home experiences that we were talking about earlier, Bruce. But on the other side of the spectrum, we're going to be seeing brands dabble into virtual reality in the metaverse in very interesting ways. So I think beyond the screen as we know it is going to be the most interesting and standout trend um, that we're going to be watching in the year to come. It definitely uh, metaverse, definitely the buzzword at the moment. I should probably check Google Trends as to when that started to pop, you know, because uh, it wasn't that long ago, but it's certainly a lot of people talking about it now and will be uh, this year. But I'm so a question for both of you, um, and I'll, I'll start with Bruce. I mean, what, it, what is the, your message then to brands who are thinking about how to strategize in 2022? What should they be paying attention to or what should they be thinking about? So I do agree with you, Aaron. I think it is brand purpose. It was a brand trust index report that was just put out in the last week. And brands are more trusted than governments. You know, it, they, they, are, they are holding up. So we have to use that trust. We have to leverage that. Um, and you leverage that into building the relationships with the customers and the consumers. Like, do not fail on that trust. With that trust comes loyalty. With that trust comes first party data. And we also managed to get through 35 minutes without talking about privacy. Right. <laughs> um, so, so I think that, that as a brand marketer, I need to continue to build that first party relationship, getting people to my sites, getting them to opt into my brand and engage with the brand. That in turn gives me a better base to fuel a more privacy compliant first party media program across online and offline. Um, so I would be very focused on trust, on loyalty, and on building that engagement so that I have a right to market in a post-cookie loss of identifier landscape. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, when we thought back to our trends and kind of like what was the um, most common denominator between all those, uh, we came to the conclusion, you know, after two years of sold experiences for consumers, consumers only want consu or consumers only want experiences going into 2022. And we're going to be seeing all different types of newfound experiences that brands are going to be investing in for these consumers in order to have their own brand name stand out. So whether that's, you know, simplifying their product through a super app or having them be a consultant or a new life milestone or, you know, um, training their employees to, uh, you know, uh, be a virtual reality assistant, right, for a new product that they're leveraging. I think brands are, should consider experiences and how are you going to create a new and novel experience for your consumer? Um, because that's going to help your brand stand out in 2020. Mm. I would agree with that one. And what we've seen is the term customer experience has become much more of a technology term. It's brand experience, every touch point with that brand. But the other side of it is that employee or human experience that how do I, how do I re energize or, or train my employees to serve our customers and engage with our customers and represent the brand experience? 
so that you're consistent across all of those touch points. And this, I think, is going to be a again another big focus. So I completely that that employee part. I think it's really important. It's also really hard when everybody's not together. Yeah, I think um, an industry to watch on that front is going to be insurance, because there's a bit of a dichotomy going on there, right? Because you have all these insure tech platforms, but you're also seeing you know different brands experiment in cool ways how to motivate consumers to engage with agents more and positioning the agents in the whole kind of like digital ecosystem and where exactly should they fit. So you have some brands positioning agents as a way to help customize the experience and you have other brands positioning that human touch as a way to help simplify the experience as well. But I think, you know, those winning strategies are going to be able to, you know, balance that digital experience with the human touch um, very well. I think it's, yeah, I mean, so privacy, I mean, experience, those are two really good themes. And I think obviously with this increase in activity that's expected for 2022, I guess at the end of the day, it becomes more difficult to stand out because everybody's spending more, everyone's marketing more. So that means markets, you know, markets need to be more creative, more strategic, more targeted, uh, more innovative. And I kind of think it raises the bar in terms of, you know, the level you need to reach to achieve success. Um, but as we're, so we're coming to, it's been a great conversation. It was coming to a close. I just want to ask you then, given the, given all of this, could you, uh, name a brand to watch or an industry to watch? And Aaron, you mentioned insurance, but if you could name a brand to watch for 2022, who have you got your eye on in particular, Bruce? Um, so obviously watching what happens at Google mm-hmm. because of their dominant market share and because of a somewhat hostile FTC. Mm-hmm. Will and across the pond, <clears throat> you've seen so many fines, Facebook, Google, etc. The regulatory landscape, and it's it's less about a privacy issue than have they gotten too big and too important. So we're going to watch Google to see if Google can stay together, or is this another Microsoft where we've got ten years of, of slow pressure from regulators? So I think we're watching them. Amazon, we always watch. But I think it's the fintechs that we really want to watch and see if they, they make in right this year. Yeah. Mm. Uh, excellent. Learn. Yeah, on that note of fintech, I would say my brand to watch is uh, Klarna. So buy now, pay later is a huge topic for our team, right? We've been constantly monitoring those brands, right? But I think Klarna is just such an interesting use case because they've made some really interesting and bold investments in both their product and their marketing. So with their product, you know, they're becoming a super app, but they're not necessarily becoming a financial super app. They're becoming a shopping super app. So they're kind of blurring those lines between an online shopping experience and um, like a payments provider, right? But then... You know, on a marketing standpoint, I mentioned earlier that they're very bullish about out of home and they've been doing some really interesting you know, out of home experiences, but they're also such a mainstay within paid social marketing as well. And they've had some really interesting campaigns there. So I think it's going to be really interesting seeing a digital only brand like Klarna um, really enter into an offline marketing realm and balance that with their already strong digital marketing presence. So it's going to be really interesting to see on that front. I'm going to I'll add, I'll add a fintech into the mix as well. I, I just uh, recently had the uh, pleasure of interviewing the CEO of Aspiration for the podcast. And uh, Aspiration is a fascinating company. It's all uh, focused on sustainability and fighting climate change. And what's fascinating about why I pick, why I pick Aspiration is that, you know, here you have, in similar fashion to Klarna, you've got a company that's looking to really disrupt an industry and build its brand. And they've got the investment, they've got the dollars to build the brand. And so we've already seen some really interesting creative um, marketing activity, whether it's through direct mail, email, podcast, podcasts, uh, video, uh, and they really are ramping up. So I would say uh, my sort of brand to watch for when it comes to marketing in 2022 is Aspiration. Um, all right. Well, that was a brilliant conversation. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for joining us as, as a guest to kick off the new season. Thank you, Liaren. 
thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe, rate and review us. If you want to know more about Mintel, who we are and what we do, head over to mintel.com and follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And check out our blog for even more insights from our analysts. Bye for now. Bye for now.